Within the Giver universe, there are 12 Zoalords from the start of the story. This video will cover the ones that were defeated and are no longer part of the story. The Zoalords have unique powers. They stand as the pinnacle leaders of the Kronos Corporation, and above all of them stands Arkenfell. His power is unmatched. He was the first Zoalord created by an alien race long ago. All the life forms on this planet were designed to serve them in a war. Arkenfell has lived through the ages of time, but now he is resting and waiting. When his resting place was discovered by Hamilcar Barkas, he gifted him a Zoa crystal, then gave him the task of seeking out other subjects. Each one was given a Zoa crystal and modified to become a Zoa lord, but Arkenfell had a bigger plan in his mind. He wanted to go deep into space, to find his creators that betrayed him, but his mission required a total of 12 Zoalords. This council of 12 would embark on a mission to shape the future of mankind. If you're new to the Giver story and want a full breakdown about Arkenfell, I have a separate video for that topic, but this video will cover what happened to the Zoalords. This council first began with 12 members, but this number changed throughout the story. Some of them would defect as they had their own plans, others would continue following Arkenfell's wishes, and a few of them were destroyed. This video will cover the ones that are no longer part of the story, as far as I can search in the manga. So going in order of the story, let's begin with Commander Guo. He was the leader of Kronos Japan, but he defected very early in the story, having his own secret agenda that was hidden from the other Zoalords. Guo realized that a Giver unit bonding with a living organism would increase their power. The Zoalords were already stronger than the Givers, and if one was able to bond with a Giver unit, this would create a Giver Zoalord, a being more powerful than the others, and free from any mind control of Arkenfell or the creators, which were also called Uranus. The Giver units were very rare on Earth, and he wanted one for himself. Arkenfell learned of Guo's plan to betray everyone, so he personally went to deal with Guo. He confronted him at Relic's Point within Mount Minakami, demanding that Guo hand over the unit remover. Guo would not comply. He ran deep into the base to find the unit remover and find a Giver before Arkenfell stops him. Guo was the last subject to be transformed into a Zoalord. When he was fully processed, he never met Arkenfell, so he has no idea how much stronger Arkenfell is than everyone else. Even with 11 Zoalords combined, they would not be able to beat him. Arkenfell would catch up to him, only for Guo to fight back against his master. This was only meant to slow down Arkenfell, as Guo continues to run away, trying to find the unit remover before Arkenfell can take it away from him. At some point, Guo would activate his most powerful attack, the Black Hole. It was the only way to get rid of Arkenfell, since he could not damage his master physically, this was his last option against Arkenfell. Guo came so close to getting a Giver unit, but he had to abandon his mission when the other Zoalords arrived. He tries to escape, but someone appears above him. Arkenfell has returned, now in his complete and most powerful Zoalord battle form. This great aura emanates from his body. He is truly a god above everyone. Arkenfell would use his power to immobilize Guo, pulling his body closer as Guo is helpless and unable to move, then ripping the Zoa crystal from his head. Guo's body would take even more damage from Giver 3's pressure cannon. The impact would leave a large hole in Guo's chest. The manga does not show Guo's body after this scene. It skips to Arkenfell preparing for his encounter with Giver 1 and Giver 3. But the 2005 TV show did. His body falls down below while he's still holding the unit remover. Arkenfell says the remover is no more, hinting that it gets destroyed, maybe from the lava erupting within the volcano. The last scene here is Arkenfell holding the Zoa crystal that was taken from Guo, which is later used in the story. The body of Masaki Murakami, who was a proto-Zoa lord, is nearby. 
he is later turned into the 13th Zoalord that is modified to serve Arkenfell. This is actually not the end of Guo, as he would appear again, but very far into the story. His body was recovered by a Zoalord that had secretly rebelled with two others, as they have their own agenda. Guo's body was repaired and processed. He is no longer a Zoalord. He is much weaker than before. When his Zoa crystal was taken by Arkenfell, he lost all his power. But they were able to restore some of his power, but not on the same scale as what it used to be. One form he was seen to use is controlling a giant spider body. This is around the time when he encounters Giver II female. This form is said to be called Unus Fourfold Form Guo Quadriga. The back end has some organs that pop up and they release a powerful laser. The one who rebelled against Arkenfell. The one amongst the Zoa Lords. Everyone thought he was destroyed at Mount Minakami, but here he stands. His new body is able to divide, separating each section to form a group of Zoanoids at his command. With a new body, he will continue his evil ways. His power level is now equal to a proto Zoalord. He is reminded by Krumegnik that Guo will still have to undergo further treatments. He was given a dummy crystal, and it has a time limit. If he does not receive support from them, he will lose his current power. After this transmission with Krumegnik, it shows that Guo has teamed up with Giver 2 female, but this is kept as a secret from other Zoalords. Even though Gyo's return is known by a few, there is another that is aware of him, Apollon, a mysterious and powerful being that is gathering the crystals from other Zoalords. He is fully aware that Gyo has come back, but he will use him for his own reasons. He will follow him and lead him to the others. The bodies that are part of Gyo's transformation can fight on their own once they are separated. They would just be mediocre Zoanoids at this point. But if they combine multiple bodies together, their performance will increase along with gaining special abilities. There is also a double form that I found in the manga, but the triple state seems to be a better choice in combat since it amplifies their strength and doubles the armor on the body. But if they repeatedly combine, this will exhaust their physical cells. This form can only be maintained for a certain amount of time. There is also a restriction as to how many times each individual can combine. There is a part in the story when Guo runs into Apollon, and this powerful being says to him, I have no interest in your dummy crystal. Apollon throws Guo away very easily. He only wanted to capture the Sagawa siblings and bring them to the island of Scylla. There, they would meet Arkenfell. So, going back to Guo, later in the story, Apollon would locate the hiding place of Gyo. He is even able to penetrate Gyo's thought waves, something only a Zoalord would be able to do. Another person enters the picture, which is just Aptum covering the body of Giver 1. This just gives them some extra powers. They don't know who this being is for now, but they ask Apollon a question. Gyo would use this chance to run away, then causing a fire, hoping to cover his tracks. Apollon would use two wave attacks against Guo, trying to cut off his limbs and stop him. Guo's limbs do get cut off, but they regenerate, and he keeps running. This powerful attack creates a huge trench to stop the forest fire from spreading. Aptum would use some of the Giver's powers to freeze the entire area, which puts out the forest fire. But in doing so, he has used up too much energy, and is forced to detach from Giver 1, which reveals the identity of to Apollon, who is watching them. A short time later, Apollon and Giver Gigantic would team up, searching for Guo. Giver 1 wants to know where Mizuki and Tetsuro are, and Apollon wants to know who is helping Guo. Guo is now being chased by two powerful beings, so he comes up with a plan. He goes to a construction site, scales to the top, and jumps in the direction of Apollon. The plasma shot vaporizes Gyo's quadriga body, but Gyo is not gone. He merely used the Unus regeneration ability to create a meat puppet, which acted as a distraction. At the right time, he was able to detach from the body and escape into the sewers, 
he also damaged some of the building so it starts to fall apart. Giver 1 transforms into Gigantic Exceed. He is able to reduce the impact of the falling structure so it does not collapse onto nearby homes. This is the main part of the story that Gyo is featured in. He is then absent for a good portion of the story, only appearing later for one small scene when Gigantic Exceed fights against Dragon Lord. Now let's move on to another Zoa Lord. This one is called Emakarum Mirabilis. He is the 13th Zoa Lord. He was previously Masaki Murakami, which was also a proto Zoa Lord. He was a friend of Giver 1, Sho Fukamachi. Giver 3 and Giver 1 would sneak into a base called Cloud Gate. They were looking for a certain Zoa Lord, but instead they end up meeting Emakarum Mirabilis. Sho Fukamachi knows this man's voice, but this is not the friend he knew long ago. This person is now the enemy. Giver 3 gets attacked, which knocks him out for a short amount of time. Giver 1 would remind the enemy of his past of being Mr. Murakami, but it's no use trying. He is lost to being a Zoa Lord. They must fight. Mirabilis would use his pressure blast to attack Giver 3 and Aptum, leaving Giver 1 alone to fight against him, but he is too strong for Giver 1, and as Mirabilis reaches for the control metal, it goes into a self-defense mode to call on the chrysalis that contains Giver Gigantic. He would use the Giga Smasher attack as a distraction and escape, but he missed his target on purpose. While Arkenfell is still going through his illness that requires him to take long periods of rest, he created Mirabilis to serve as his devoted and faithful servant. His task is to obtain the G unit at any cost. Mirabilis would fight against Giver Gigantic later on, but because Sho is not willing to push himself, he is not able to finish off the enemy, which is his downfall. He gets overpowered and beaten. As Giver 1 is being tortured by Mirabilis, he is able to call forth the Chrysalis of Gigantic, but this time Giver 3 steps in to take the power of Gigantic. Agito Makashima has always been the fighter that never held back in combat. If he wanted something done, he would do it, regardless of the consequences. This makes him a better opponent against Mirabilis. The full power of Gigantic Dark, with no reason to hold back, makes him extremely dangerous. Gigantic Dark proves to be a much tougher opponent. He even manages to stop the virtual black hole attack from Mirabilis, then proceeds to land a single punch on the Zoa crystal of Mirabilis. The force is so strong that the crystal begins to crack from the impact. Arkenfell would then awaken, sensing the pain that Mirabilis is going through. The gigantic armor is then removed from Giver 3 as he used up too much energy then he retreats. Meanwhile, Arkenfell arrives to recover the body of Mirabilis. He is transported to the island of Scylla and placed within a pod that once held Arkenfell. His body is left inside to heal his injuries. Mirabilis would appear later in the story, so I'll get back to him when that happens. The next Zoa Lord I want to talk about is Friedrich von Pergstel. He commands the power of lightning. While his long-range attacks are extremely powerful, his body is not designed for close-range combat. He is a Zoa Lord, but he does not have enough combat knowledge. But still, he steps up to fight against Giver Gigantic. Meanwhile, three other Zoa Lords watch from a distance, already plotting to attack the victor of this battle. Whoever wins, they will surely be in a weakened state after the battle. Pergstall does manage to land an extremely well-timed and powerful lightning bolt on Giver Gigantic. Just as he gets close enough, the bolt strikes him down, causing massive damage to his armor. The three other Zoa Lords that are waiting for Pergstall to finish his battle have already concluded that he suffered internal injuries. He is barely able to stand and unable to use his lightning bolt attack anymore. Soon, the three of them will approach Pergstall in his weakened state. We then get a short scene of another Zoa Lord. His name is Shin Rubio Aminicolas. He would be informed about the battle currently happening. He is concerned for Pergstall 
and flies towards his location, hoping he will get there in time. Pergstal would lose the battle against Giver Gigantic. In his weakened state, he is about to be finished off, but then Giver Gigantic tells him that his tactic of using a hyperzoonoid disguised as a gigantic was despicable. Pergstal is not sure what he's talking about. Then he thinks, perhaps this was all set up. Those three Zoolords would then show up to assist Pergstal. One of them attacks Aptum. Giver Gigantic took too much damage in that battle, and so he is unable to fight three Zoolords at the same time. Giver Three would call forth and demand the armor of the Gigantic. Sho tries to refuse, but his will is unmatched by Agito's desire. Sho would lose the Gigantic armor and reverts back to Giver One. He is now at the mercy of the Zoolords before him. Aptum would sacrifice himself by turning 70% of his body into biological missiles, attacking the Zoolords continuously, giving Sho enough time to escape. But when the dust clears, it is Aptum that is doomed to serve the Zoolords in a different way. Pergstal would then question the other Zoolords about them luring the Giver out by using a hyperzoonoid disguised as a gigantic. The others just look at him. By the time Shin Rubio arrives, it's too late. Pergstal has been defeated by someone. Since the exit wound is outside the chest, the attack that took his life must have been from behind, like where the three Zoolords were standing. His body would then be sent to the central seat of Arizona with orders to place him under cryogenic treatment. These three Zoolords are interested in the Giver unit, just as Richard Gua was. They would destroy their own Zoolords if they had to, and would do it again, even if Shinrubio also gets in their way. Arkenfell had also constructed a giant biological ship designed for galactic warfare. The ship was created in the sea, but now it orbits above Earth. But suddenly, it starts moving to a new location. It would absorb the sunlight and store it as a power source. There is currently no one aboard the ship. They assume it's being controlled by someone, but there is only one Zoolord that is in a position to control the Ark. It stops over the island of Scylla and fires a huge blast of energy down towards the temple, and within that area lies the body of Emacarum Mirabilis. He then awakens, fully healed, but also feeling an intense force within his body. He can also feel the presence of the Ark far above his location. The beam that was fired upon the temple, it seems like it was some kind of revitalizing energy that has no destructive force. It's possible that the purpose of this blast was to give energy to someone. Arkenfell was the one who controlled the Ark. He was trying to heal Mirabilis much quicker and restore him to full power, but it seems he might have been granted even more power than before. He then requests Mirabilis to return his body to the sanctuary of Scylla so that he can rest. The story then goes to Arizona. Giver 3 would find a way to enter the central seat base, also bringing his Libertus army. He got information about another relic ship. Before he can enter, he is stopped by three Zoolords, Dr. Barkus and two others. Wafer Danos, who controls all plant life around him. The other one is Li Yensui, the one who controls teleportation. Wafer Danos would cover the ground with what looks like his hair. It fully wraps around gigantic dark, tying him up and squeezing him, but he's able to slice through it all and break free. He then battles against Li Yensui, who proves to be more difficult because of his teleportation powers, but he is slowly trying to understand how it works. Wafer Danos would get a hold of Gigantic Dark again, but this time he slices his own leg off to free himself and flies upward. Dealing with two Zoolords proves to be a challenge, but he's able to figure out the power of Li Yensui and use it against him. He has been defeated, but by Wafer Danos. Wafer Danos would launch another attack of his veil, but his time has run out. His hair begins to dissolve. He hands over his Zoa crystal to Dr. Barkus, as his servants begin to awaken below. Roots of a tree cover the entire ground and the relic. 
the Zoa crystal merely gives him the power to compress all plant life into his body, to give him a human form. Without the crystal, his body spreads across the land. Gigantic Dark would deal with the many plant life enemies below him, simply by starting a fire that burns through all the vegetation. Giver 3 would then lose control of the gigantic armor Sho had called upon it during his time of need. The Libertus army would show up. They jump on Wafferdanos and explode. Another Zoolord has finally been defeated. Within that ship, Wafferdanos would take the two control medals and give them to Dr. Barkas. He would help him escape before the site exploded. Li Yensui would also give up his Zoa crystal during his last moments. Once outside, Dr. Barkas gets blasted by energy beams in the back. It's Giver 3 who takes him down. Giver 3 would take these control medals, which then allows him to create his own gigantic dark, without the need to take the gigantic from Giver 1. Dr. Barkas recovers from these injuries, as he is seen later in the story. He kept the last remaining branch of Wafferdanos. There's not enough cells to recreate his body, so it's just kept to further their science. The next Zoolord I want to look at is Cabral Khan. He has the power to control zoonoids like the others, but he can also absorb them to increase his power and body size into another form. Shin Rubio realizes that if Cabral Khan grows to his full size, he will destroy the base. He tries to stop the other zoonoids with his mind control, but it's too late. The assimilation process has already begun. Cabral would hit Shin with one of his long tentacles. The attack is blocked by Shin and he is tossed outside. He watches as the mindless zoonoids continue to walk inside, giving up their bodies and absorbed by Cabral Khan. His mind control powers were amplified by the PWR device, which is locked onto Cabral. He's able to reach out to every zoonoid in the city. These were humans that were processed into zoonoids. They too are more bodies to absorb. Cabral would then reveal his true dragon form, bursting through the base as Giver Gigantic watches this massive beast. Both Aptum and Giver Gigantic are no match for this massive Zoolord. Shofu Kamachi would find a way to increase the power of Gigantic, to surpass its power level, to create something stronger, bigger, more powerful. The end result is a transformation into Gigantic Exceed, the Red Giant. The Dragon Lord would open his wings, fly up above, and unleash his ultimate extermination attack, the Whale's Purgatorium. This attack uses the energy of thousands of zoonoids. He plans to leave Shinjuku region into a giant blast furnace. Sho realizes that a clash between that attack and his own Giga Smasher might result in more damage to the city, so he decides to use a new attack that can minimize the damage below. The Red Giant would unleash a micro black hole. The attack is smaller than the Whale's Purgatorium from the Dragon Lord but this new attack still destroys the Purgatorium and continues onward, crushing anything it touches, hitting the Dragon Lord and defeating him. The black hole then evaporates on its own. Shin Rubio had witnessed this new destructive power of the Gigantic. It is no longer the Giver Gigantic they knew. He decides to name it Gigantic XD, which stands for Exceed, which is a way of saying it is surpassing its previous power level. Moments later, we see Cabral Khan is still alive. He was able to escape the shell of the Dragon Lord before it was destroyed. Before he is able to escape, Aptam shows up. He inherited powers from Hayami. He unleashes a blast towards Cabral Khan and destroys him. His Zoolord crystal is then seen floating in the air, as if it's being controlled to go somewhere it lands in the hand of Apollon. He is going around collecting the Zoolord crystals, and this one took almost no effort to acquire. Another Zoolord that is defeated in the story is Edward Carleon. He is seen protecting the three Zoolord crystals that belong to Pergstal, Wafferdanos, and Li Yensui. Their crystals will be used to create the next set of Zoolords, as the Ark requires 12 Zoolords to move the ship through space. Apollon would show up on the Ark 
and subdue the hyperzoonoids in the area by using his mind control powers, which gives the clue that he might be a zoonoid, since only they can do this to zoonoids. He would confront Carleon and demand that he turn over the zoonoid crystals. If he does not resist, Apollon will spare his life. Carleon would feel this overwhelming power from this being that stands before him. Apollon shows to have no trouble dealing with this Zoalord. He can control the same plasma spheres and produce after images of himself. He can copy every power that Carleon has. Carleon then realizes that only one other person could copy his powers, and that would be his lord. But this might be someone else. Carleon would lose the battle, and his Zoalord crystal gets removed. All that's left is a husk of his body that's accelerating to old age. The last two Zoalords in the story would be hiding out in the Karakorm base. This final battle in the story, as far as I could find, would have these two Zoalords, Jabir and Krumegnik, combining together to create a large monster. The name of this creature could be the Jet Black Demon. Jabir would be positioned in the eye, and Krumegnik would be placed in the chest area. The gigantic exceed was only used by Shofu Kamachi, but Agito Makashima found a way to access it. When he lost a fight to Shofu Kamachi, he linked his control metal to his own and shared the data with him. He was then able to learn how to transform his own gigantic into an exceed. This enemy is able to compress air into dense balls that create explosions equal to over a ton of TNT. It flies into the air and starts producing multiple tornadoes. They are so strong that it destroys the rock nearby. Seconds later, the tornadoes start to shrink until it's gone. Gigantic Exceed would fire a micro black hole into the supercell to absorb the energy and matter, causing it to disappear. While the enemy was distracted, he gets behind them, plunges his right hand through them to grab Kermagnik from the chest. This Zolord is the one who has been altering the air's density to be used as a weapon. This enemy does not seem like a challenge. With one Zolord removed, it has lost half of its power. Its body is just made up from black particles gathered from the air and formed into the shape we see now. It really does not have much power behind it. It's more like an illusion. Gigantic Exceed would mock Jabir, which then enrages him. He then unleashes one final attack. As Gigantic Exceed defends himself, he notices the monster's eye is now missing as his blades go through the enemy and the body starts to wither away. We can see that this was just a distraction. Behind the body, you will see the eyeball going in another direction. It starts to peel away, revealing that Jabir is in his Zoalord battle form as he makes his escape. And that is as far as I was able to read into the Giver manga. After all these years, the story was never completed. But there is one more character I would like to cover. I might as well talk about Apollon for the last part of this video. His identity has not been revealed yet, as the story of the Giver manga was never completed. All we can do is look at the evidence and create some theories on who this person might be. One theory is that he is a member or creation of the Uranus that came back to collect the Zoalord crystals. But this would have been a secret Zoalord that was designed by the creators and was only released now. Another theory is that Apollon is really Mirabilis, a Zoalord that bonded with a Giver unit. There's plenty of clues that say this could be true. The first clue is that he can subdue Zoanoids with just his mind, something that is only available to Zoalords, and he was able to penetrate the thought waves of Guo. Then there's that time when Mirabilis was healing within a pod that was similar to the one that Arkenfell was held within, or perhaps it was the same one. Then he was hit by a rejuvenating beam from the Ark, which made him feel incredible power from within his body. This process might have passed down some of Arkenfell's power into him, making him stronger than before. If some of Arkenfell's power was transferred into Mirabilis, who might be Apollon, this would explain 
why he has no trouble dealing with any Zoa Lord. He is able to fight against all of their powers or use the same powers as them, something that only Arkenfell could do. When Masaki Murakami was a proto Zoa Lord, he used a wave attack with his hand. This would slice through a target. The same attack was used by Mirabilis when he fought against Gigantic Dark, and also by Apollon, except its power was increased even more. One of the manga chapters has this attack titled as The Sword That Breaks the Earth. There were only three Zoa Lords that knew about the secret island, Arkenfell, Dr. Barkus, and Mirabilis, but now Apollon seems to know about it, and when he sees Arkenfell, he does not even approach him or speak to him. He can teleport to any location, just like Arkenfell was shown to do, which let him appear out of thin air and disappear very quickly. Apollon gives off a huge amount of pressure when his presence is near another Zoa Lord, similar to this intense aura that Arkenfell gives off. After the incident of the Ark, the sensors were able to capture images of Apollon, but the most interesting thing about this person is that the mantle protector that is all over the body of Apollon, that is a metal which does not exist on Earth. His armor is said to be the same material of the Giver. The other question is, where did he find a Giver unit? So all of this information seems like he could be a Giver Zoa Lord. He has the same powers as other Zoa Lords. He can peer into the minds of Zoanoids. This would mean he was most likely a Zoa Lord at some point. But no other Zoa Lord can read his mind, since he is a Giver which blocks the control the creators would have over him. And here's another thing I found. Did you ever wonder about this item? It's seen when Arkenfell is wearing his suit or the outfit on the island of Scylla. Well, the design of this pin is based off the eyes of the creators, the ones that spoke to him when he awakened for the first time. You can also see this is carved on the door that leads to the pod where Arkenfell was kept within. He always carries the memory of their eyes. That's all he could see about them. The fate of Krumegnik is unknown. His last appearance was battling against Gigantic Dark Exceed. He was captured, and I'm not sure if this scene means he's in pain or if he's really defeated. As far as I could read in the manga, here is a list of Zolords that were defeated. Pergstal, Carleon, Kablar Khan, Wafer Danos, and Li Yensui. They were all defeated, and all five Zolord crystals were collected by Apollon. There's also this Zoa Lord here, who goes by the name of Tuaha de Galenos. He's barely been in the story. I only saw him a few times, but he didn't talk much. First one was during a meeting with the other Zoa Lords, when they were all informed about Gyo's plan to rebel against everyone else. There's another appearance near Mount Minakami. They were supposed to get rid of Gyo, but instead they all attacked the relic ship to prevent the Gyvers from taking it. He would also be seen with the other Zoa Lords. All twelve of them would raise the Ark from under the sea, then all of them would be within the Ark afterwards. He also appears during a Zoa Lord meeting where they discuss what happened at the base in Arizona. You can see him at the table, but he does not speak. And after this, I don't think we see him anymore. You may remember that Arkenfell mentions that his Ark requires 12 Zoa Lords to make it move. This is true, but this plan was not originally his. The first time this was mentioned was by the creators themselves. This was their plan all along. Arkenfell just adopted the plan. He wants to go into space and chase after the creators. Alright, so that's it. This was a topic that I wanted to cover for a long time, and finally it's done. I know there's a lot of other story details that I left out, along with important characters, but the point of this video was to explain what happened to every Zoa Lord that was defeated, and to include some story elements to help you understand what's going on. If there's any other topic about the Giver manga that you want me to cover, then just leave a comment. I could cover other characters and explain their story, like the Libertas creatures, Hayami, Aptam's evolution, or maybe Shizu that was turned into a Zoa Lord called Griselda. So who is your favorite character in the Giver universe? For me, it has to be Apollon. He is not good or evil. He remains neutral in this battle. He has his own mission. He is so strong 
that he could even handle a Giver Gigantic Exceed easily. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video.